What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I am always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the Saints. And this Monday, in the fifth and final week of Lent, things are really picking up. We're into Mark 14, we're at the Garden of Gethsemane, and of course, we've got our Lenten catechesis and our quote from Martin Luther. So let's get started. Stick around. <music> So for Saturday and Sunday, uh, we continued on through Mark, and now we're picking up late into Mark chapter 14. We're after the institution of the Lord's Supper. We're into the Garden of Gethsemane, where I guess you could say the the passion proper uh, is, is going to begin. You see, in Jewish tradition, uh, probably in Christian tradition too, as, as we refer to uh, evening and morning prayer, uh, ties back into Genesis. There was evening and there was morning the first day. So uh, to the Jewish mind, this is Friday. The sun has set uh, and now uh, it is Friday. Uh, although for, for our mindset, it's Thursday night. So let's get into the Garden of Gethsemane. We're on Mark 14, beginning at verse 32. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And the young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. So scholars believe that the uh, the young man that fled naked was Mark. Um... It, random little detail thrown in there. Uh, this is one of the simplest, I think, accounts of, of the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, and this one doesn't include uh, them asking Jesus if he if he is Jesus and, and uh, in the Greek, ego, a me, I am uh, Jesus, <laughs> uh, which causes terror and they all fall to the ground. Um, here we see a ve I struggle to say a very human Jesus Jesus certainly is fully man absolutely unequivocally human he is also fully absolutely unequivocally God and we see here in his prayer the human the humanity crying out to the Father that there has to be another way. Of course, he knows there's not. And so 
he says, not my will, but yours be done. Um, is this the one? Let this pa cup pass from me? No, I don't think this was in this one. The cup of wrath uh, that Jesus is going to drink, this, this disgusting poison, he knows it uh, because he's God. We can see the divinity shining through even in his humanity. My soul is very sorrowful even to death. He knows. He knows what the Father's asking, and, and in his frail humanity, he asks for another way, but still in his frail humanity and perfect obedience to his Father. He says, not my will, but thine be done. And it's this obedience credited to you and me on account of what Christ goes through. This also is the night uh, where Jesus is so panic-stricken, stressed, um, knowing what's going to happen, the torture that he's going to endure, his capillaries break and he sweats blood and pouring himself face ground into the dirt in prayer to his father. Not the uh, clean Jesus that we're used to seeing in, in most movies of the crucifixion, but certainly the suffering of our Lord has now begun uh, as we continue through the passion narrative for this last week of Lent. Uh, but what does what does all this mean? What does all this have to do? Well, uh, we turn to a writing from Martin Luther, uh, and I think it puts it all into perspective for us. After man has thus become aware of his sin and is terrified in his heart, he must watch that sin does not remain in his conscience. For this would lead to sheer despair. Just as our knowledge of sin flowed from Christ and was acknowledged by us, so we must pour this sin back on him and free our conscience of it. Therefore beware, lest you do as those perverse people who torture their hearts with their sins and strive to do the impossible, namely, get rid of their sins by running from one good work or penance to another, or by working their way out of this by means of indulgences. You... Cast your sins from yourself and onto Christ when you firmly believe that his wounds and sufferings are your sins. To be born and paid for by him, as we read in Isaiah 53, 6, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. St. Peter says, in his body he has borne our sin on the wood of the cross. 1 Peter 2, 24. St. Paul says, God has made him a sinner for us so that through him we would be made just, 2 Corinthians 5.21. You must stake everything on these and similar verses. The more your conscience torments you, the more tenaciously must you cling to them. If you do not do that, but presume to still your conscience with your contrition and penance, you will never obtain peace of mind and will have to despair in the end. If we allow sin to remain in our conscience and try to deal with it there, or if we look at sin in our heart, it will be too much too strong for us and will live on forever. But if we behold it resting on Christ and see it overcome by his resurrection and then bodily believe this, even it is dead and nullified. Sin cannot remain in Christ since it is swallowed up by his resurrection. Now you see no wounds, no pain in him, and no sign of sin. Thus St. Paul declares that Christ died for our sins and rose for our justification, Romans 4.25. He bore in his flesh the sin of all mankind and condemned in our place for the sin which he bore in his very flesh. That sin was punished in his flesh. That sin was buried into the tomb. And Jesus rose again from the dead, victorious over sin, death, and the power of the devil. So we watch the sufferings of Christ, and we see it as what it is. Our sin, our sin is doing this. He is bearing the condemnation of our sin. So as Martin Luther says, put your sin where it belongs. To Christ, he will carry it. He will die. He will leave it buried in his tomb when he rises from the dead. Now, our Lenten catechesis, we were talking about baptism. Now, uh, shocking even to me, we're going to go into the keys, the office of the keys. This uh, Lenten devotion doesn't really 
put any emphasis on the Lord's Supper, which is one of the six chief parts of the small catechism, but the office of the keys are, are often overlooked, even, I think, by Lutherans. So, the office of the keys. The authority of the keys, Matthew 16, 19, or the authority of the bishops according to the gospel, is a power or commandment of God to preach the gospel, to forgive and retain sins, and to administer sacraments. Christ sends out his apostles with this command. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. John twenty twenty one through 22 And in Mark sixteen fifteen, Christ says, Go, proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. This authority is exercised only by teaching or preaching the gospel and administering the sacraments either to many or to individuals according to their calling. In this way we are given not only bodily but also eternal things, eternal righteousness, the Holy Spirit, and eternal life. These things cannot reach us except by the ministry of the word and sacraments. As Paul says, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone that believes, Romans 1.16. Therefore, the church has the authority to grant eternal things and exercise this authority only by the ministry of the word. The only authority that belongs to the bishops is what they have according to the gospel, or by divine right, as they say, for they have been given the ministry of the word and sacraments. They have no other authority according to the gospel than the authority to forgive sins, to judge doctrine, to reject doctrines contrary to the gospel, and to exclude from the communion of the church wicked people whose wickedness is known. According to this gospel authority, as a matter of necessity by divine right, congregations must obey them. For Luke ten sixteen says, The one who hears you, hears me. But when they teach or establish anything against the gospel, then the congregation is forbidden by God's command to obey them. And this comes to us from the Augsburg Confession. So this is it. Monday, Lent 5, the last week. Next week is Holy Week. And uh, I think I, I like that this does this with the Office of the Keys. Because to watch Jesus' suffering, to learn about casting our sin onto Christ so that it no longer burdens us because he has borne it and defeated it and risen above it, and then to hear that this same crucified and risen Christ has given authority to the church to say to you, I forgive you all of your sins. And to baptize you into this church, to preach God's word to you and to give to you his blessed sacrament, his body and blood. A tangible, oh, you don't believe these words that God forgives you. Here, taste and see the Lord is good. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, in the Garden of Gethsemane, you suffered the agony of drinking from the cup of your Father's wrath against our sin, being betrayed by a kiss from one of your own. Give us strength to remain awake as we now wait and watch for your coming again, knowing that the Father's wrath against us has been satisfied by your bloody death and vindicating resurrection. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you and the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.